so I've, I've, we've picked out very clinically relevant topics in endocrinology that general medicine or general physicians may come across. Next slide. Okay, fine. So first thing is hyponatremia. We see hyponatremia is a common presentation. It's a very incidental finding in our OP and IP. It's usually not evaluated before treatment. Hyponatremia means SIDH, start of call factor. That is what we see in clinical practice. What we have seen is excess water is very common in the elderly. People drink 4 liters, 5 liters of water, especially elderly, and they end up with dilution of hyponatremia. We see this very regularly. And uh, with this sort of background, we want to address what are the causes, how do we evaluate. I know the time is limited, but just a brief about what can be done to just evaluate this uh, in our regular practice. How to uh, start this off? So, with that, first question is for Dr. Professor Vijay Shagarani, sir. Uh, not all hyponatremia is SIDH. Thank you. See, hyponatremia, as you said, is a very commonest um, we seen in the hospitalized patient. You will link it on the hyponatremia as a SIDH. As itself, the name says that it is inappropriate ADH secretion or action due to a normal value. Value of the plasma vitamin, that is the SIDH. So, you have in that the various uh, uh, aspects is hyponatremia, hypoosmolality, and elevated urinary osmolality of more than 100 in presence of less than 275 of plasma. That is important here. And second thing is, as the name says, it's inappropriate. That means there should not be any cardiac. Renal, hepatic, adrenal, or thyroid problems. Simple. It be simple. In presence of absence of diuretic use, even though and also absence of whatever there is a stimulus to the 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 ADS that is the hypotension, nausea, vomiting, stress, sugar. These are the criteria for SADS. These things are not that we should think of as a so, okay, then how do you go about it? The first thing is what we do in practice is we have to find out whether it is hypotonic, normotonic, or hypotonic. Hypotonic, we know that hyperglycemia, this is all which you use, manidor and other things. So, there is what are called pseudo hyponatremic conditions, hyperproteinemia and uh, hyperlipidemia so also. But nowadays, there are various methods we can, you know, we can measure that. Even hyperglycemia. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the other aspect is the hypotonic, hy the hyponatremia. So, how do you go about further? What we do is clinically, we see just simple, you know, BP, pulse, skin target, you know, moist is what we done, then the measurement of the CVP will tell you whether you are dealing with the uvalemic, hypovalemic, or hypervalemic, uh, the hyponatremia. So, based on that, that's what measurement of CVP is very important in the uh, ICUs. And then, based on that, further segregation will be dependent on based on simple urinary sodium more than 20 or less than 20. Then we can have a variety of causes. That's a simple way to go. Sure, sir. Thank you. So, Dr. Santosh, can you take us through how to evaluate a hyponatremia? So, evaluation of hyponatremia is a difficult uh, subject, but we will try to simplify it. So, number one is the clinical parameters, so, as Dr. Vijay Shekhar has already told. Whether the person is falling into hypervolemia or hypovolemia. Hypovolemia, you have certain uh, clinical findings like decreased skin turgor, reduced capillary filling time, reduced central venous pressure, your postal hypotension, etc. So, you must think of more of those conditions which can cause hypovolemia. For example, uh, use of uh, uh, loop diuretics, you are talking about uh, loop diarrhea or any other condition which can cause hypovolemia. There are four things that we need to remember. So, number one cause could be the use of thiazide diuretics. So, somebody who is using thiazide diuretics, that means he is losing, losing sodium and water from the urine, but is replacing by drinking a lot of water. So, that is causing euvolemic hyponatremia. So, that could be one cause. Second, two important causes and easily treatable causes are, in fact, hyponatremia and uh, hypocortisolism, that is Addison's disease. We have to keep that in mind by doing an 8 kingdom cortisol and a TSH. Now, in, if we have ruled out hypocortisolism, hypothyroidism and thiazide use, euvolemic hyponatremia, 
especially with the criteria which uh, Dr. Vijay Shekhar Reddy has mentioned, that if the urine osmolarity is high and the urine sodium is greater than 20, you must consider SIDH and start investigating the causes for SIDH, which are mainly neurological disorders and cancer-related disorders. Thank you. So once we have confirmed that, let's say this is SIDH or this is, uh, we know how to treat a hypervolemic and hypovolemic uh, uh, hyponatremia, so we won't go into that. What are the treatment options available for SIDH, Dr. Ravi? Yeah, I think that's a good question that we always have a confusion as to say is that, is it a hypovolemia or uvolema? There's always a confusion for the clinical practice. And with time, we have to, these are the always confusion what it could be. Now let's make it a bit clear as to say what Dr. Santosh has said. Is this an emergency or not an emergency? Is the patient in your outpatient or inpatient? What is it that you are trying to do earlier for the patient? Do you want to correct the sodium straight away or can the patient wait? Because it's important to go down the cause than to correct the electrolytes per se if it's a chronic patient coming to your clinic. Because by correcting it, by not knowing what is causing the problem, we are going to create more problems uh, than that. So if it's an emergency, let's put these in two ways. An acute hyponatremia causing any sort of CNS disturbances, seizures, comatose patient, we all are worried in our clinic, in the emergency department. So we need to correct the sodium, but slow and steady. These are the things that have happened over weeks or months. So don't try and be too heroic to try and correct the sodium as soon as possible. So the people, what you have to think is, you don't want to correct the sodium for more than eight to 10 millimoles for the first 24 hours. Be steady, get the sodium up slowly, by either using a hypertonic saline. So if the sodium is around 110, if the patient is comatose or had a seizure, give 150 ml of hypertonic saline. But the key to treating an emergency of hyponatremia is close <coughs> vigilance monitoring of sodium. Because this can go the other way, and I think sometimes leaving the body and correcting it is what is very important. And if this is an emergency, but if in a non-emergency case and you don't know what is causing the SADH, if the patient is slightly symptomatic, and while you're looking for the no, if there's no obvious cause, as to say you ruled out adrenal disease, you ruled out the drugs that's causing hyponatremia, then again, there are drugs that can cause, tolvoptin is another drug that you could use to try and correct hyponatremia. But these are the drugs that needs to be very vigilant. You can't just prescribe it and leave the patient alone on these. You need to monitor it. And these are the not drugs. You can't give it away like uh, chocolates away to the patient. So it's very, very important. Overcorrection, overheroics is going to be a more problematic. But I think a steady, slow, vigilant obs uh, observation is what I do in my practice. Just to add on to that, we see uh, in the wards that, you know, a lot of the times 3% NS is added and tolvaptan is also added on top of that. Could you just tell us what is the actual risk of uh, getting the sodium up too quickly? So in some, what we tend to do in the wards is like fluid restriction is a good way to get your sodium up. It's an easier way to do it. I know patient may shout at you in the initial phases. But then again, what we do is with fluid restriction, if you're able to get the sodium up, fine. If, this, if the sodium is not coming up and you're thinking it's a uvolumic hyponatremia, use tolvoptin, monitor the sodium, and hopefully you would see that because the tolvoptin will act on the V2 receptors, that's your vasopressin, as Professor Vijay Shekhar already said, it's the an inappropriate ADH secretion. So what you want to do is to block the action of vasopressin on the collecting ducts of the nephrons. That's what tolvoptin does. So you could start off with 15 milligrams, see the response in a couple of days. You can go up titrate or down titrate based on the response. Most Thanks. of the patients do respond very nicely, unless the patient has got something like a non-small cell lung cancer and things where the hyponatrium is going to be a problematic till they have the treatment. Thank you. Thank you for that. And just to add to that, you shouldn't use all together, either fluid restriction or tolvaptan or 3%, but not all together because that will raise the sodium too quickly, which will cause central pontine myelinosis. So next we move on to hyperprolactinemia. This is something that we see in regular uh, practice because the prolactin is being done in packages. Uh, all the other lab, all the lab packages are doing prolactin for no reason. And some, sometimes we see that the values are high. There is a very high use of prokinetic agents like uh, levosulpride, uh, domperidone, and all that. That can actually lead to high prolactin, and it is being used both by the doctors and the public. And prolactin is also being done in a lot of fertility screenings. It's important. Actually, it's an important test to be done uh, pre-fertility uh, workup. And 
with these in context, how do we interpret these values? What is the threshold for female fertility and male fertility as well? How do we treat this uh, uh, hyperprolactinemia? So with these uh, points in context, let me start with Dr. Ravi Kumar first. So, uh, Dr. Ravi Kumar, can we uh, ask you, uh, what are the different causes of, other than, macro, uh, other than uh, a prolactinoma, what are the causes can lead to hyperprolactinemia? The things have changed in the practice uh, from UK to India. As you said, most of them are coming to my clinics with the reports. And I think first, uh, first is to try and speak to the patient, why did this report be generated? And with a lot of commercial packages across, it's challenging for me to change. And it's, it, we all have to change the practice because they're coming with some um, 50 pages of uh, tests. And we have to interpret that. Is it clinically significant or not? Smoke. So let's talk about the physiological causes. As we all said, is the patient pregnant, postpartum, pre uh, uh, is she breastfeeding? These are the causes of race prolactin. Simple things. We always see prolactin and they miss their periods. What we all, all, we all we've been taught in uh, medical school, is she pregnant? That's the first question. Second, as you rightly said, uh, use, uh, using domperidone, levosulfate across uh, all age groups have been seen and everyone around PPI, unless proved otherwise. Now, the first, the question comes to uh, the clinician is the macroprolactin. If you're seeing a prolactin levels, but the patient has got no clinical signs, what do you do? Is it necessary for you to treat or not to treat is the question. All prolactins are not necessarily treatable or you don't need to treat. So I'm going to most mainly concentrate on macroprolactinoma. So you're seeing patients on macro, uh, who's got raised prolactin asymptomatic as a part of a routine test. What we've got to do is, we do a something called a dilutional technique with the PEG, polyethylene glycol. We ask your biochemist, so the best friend for an endocrinologist is a biochemist, so I make sure my biochemist is pampered throughout the year because that's why he gives me the answer. And what you tell to do is, with the prolactin of dilutional techniques, you can make out that is the prolactin normal. High prolactin with no symptoms, speak to the biochemist, is the problem with the assay. Can you do these uh, to rule out a macroprolactinoma? And if that, with the dilutional technique, if the prolactin comes to normal, then well, you've saved the patient to go through MRIs and all the drugs. So that's very, very important aspect when you see prolactin. And the other essential part is to make sure that the patient who are on high, who, they don't have hypothyroidism, because hypothyroidism, another condition which is commonly seen, can cause a raised prolactin. So these are the two things that I will tell. Thank you. So once we've ruled out that there's all these extensive reasons for high prolactin that happening, it very, very rarely, if in a hundred, maybe two or three, or maybe five will turn out to be a microprolactinoma or a macroprolactinoma. So once we confirm that this is a microprolactinoma or we have ruled out other causes, Professor Vijay Shekharidi, how will you then go about, how will we treat a micro or a macroprolactinoma? And what are the actual indications for surgery? At a TSS, because a lot of the times TSS, uh, the transphenal surgery is done for macroprolactinomas, which is not indicated. Usually the, the presentation is for the, you know, they can either be due to hypogonadism or problems due to hyperprolactinemia leading to galacturia, and you have a hyperprolactinemia. To relieve that, we straight. And the second thing is that either impending or having a presence of some neurological signs and symptoms of the tumor, let it be anything. And thirdly, for the infertility, and sometimes even with the normal menses with mildly elevated prolactin, sometimes they'll have a luteal dysfunction. They also should be treated. So these are the conditions where we treat them. So fortunately, we have a DOPA agonist to treat these conditions and these are the tumors will, you know, they melt like, they melt away, we can say. So, so what are the indicators? Even, even when there is a neurological, neurolog impending neurological problems, that is uh, even for the, I uh, use a visual disorder, visual also, we can treat the, even in the macro adenoma also. So size is not the criteria for the micro or macro. You, both the conditions you treat with the DOPA agonist. Uh, in fact, okay, there are, in the textbooks we see or in the guidelines they say that the tumor more than three just who is presenting, young lady going for a pregnancy, you operate. Even them also, we have treated them with the medication and they have recovered very well and even with the pregnancy also, we can give the medication. To tell you, obviously, there is absolutely nowadays, you know, becoming lesser and lesser indications for the surgery. surgery. So, then who are the people 
who should receive the people who are not responding to your therapy usually you know though more the size more the secretion they respond well some of the some of them does not secrete they doesn't respond the tumors that's one and uh, those who have got intolerance to the medication not not or neurological things are not coming down the size is not regression or there are conditions where we cannot use the medications like in those patients who has got psychological problems and on antipsychotics giving a both the things may be a problem then surgery is indication then uh, the the this the not responding intolerance the other thing is patient is not preferring for a surgery is another clear indication you know patient is not preferring for a surgery you can go for why all this thing is because you know it is easy to scoop away micro prolactinoma everything will go away recurrence rate is less but it's a macro adenoma it's very difficult to remove the excise all the tumor there will be some remnant so but the various studies have shown that you know the recurrence rate is somewhere around 18 to 20% again you have to treat medically you cannot go for a re surgery and other things so only indications for surgery is the characteristic preference even if there is an obstruction causing visual disturbance also you can give a medical like that preference not tolerating not responding is the indication or psychiatric problems both the drugs posing a problem is an indication for this as well that we don't yeah. use thank you and we got the drugs like as you know we earlier we used to use bromocriptine now we no longer using now only cabergol is the drug of choice a simple drug very easy to use side effects are very less you know and that is the used drug thank you thank you sir so dr santosh <clears throat> you have a large referral base from gynecology and obstetricians and uh, i'm sure you come across a lot of will focus only on female infertility prime infertility with a raised prolactin and a lot of the times the obstetricians already start them on on the cabergolin so what was what is your experience in this i just wanted to know about so if if my genuine request to everyone is if the prolactin is high especially if it is above 50 please put an endocrinology consultation <laughs> before starting on uh, cabergolin because the patient might be having certain other things which can be picked up but yes so for fertility treatment especially as dr vijay shekhar reddy has says even if the prolactin is above 30 the periods are regular no galactoria is there and we have ruled out hypothyroidism as a cause of high prolactin we still do treat with cabergolin because it helps in improving the luteal phase defects so the luteal phase defects are lesser the chances of becoming pregnant are higher if you use a low dose of cabergolin in these cases even if they don't have any other uh, uh, cause apparent cause for uh, this thing pcod per se causes high prolactin we know that and estrogen used during fertility treatment also increases the prolactin per se so giving a cabergolin in this setting i think we we should go ahead because it's a harmless drug has been eluded thank you thank you for that so we'll move on to the next uh, topic which is precocious puberty we are seeing a lot of uh, girls especially having uh, early puberty i wouldn't say precocious but early puberty the definitions of the age are changing there is different a uh, age uh, uh, at diagnosis for diagnosis recently and uh, the the this is important because uh, early puberty also sometimes we tend to treat to uh, affect the final height of the child and the psyche of the child you know you don't want a 8 and 9 year old girl to have uh, uh, periods although it is considered physiologically normal now and so what are the definitions and when do we actually start to treat and what is the guidelines and what is the normal practice that we do so let's uh, hear from the experts about these things uh, dr santosh i'll start with you first uh, what is the current age for diagnosis in practice when will you start treating this so by definition still in india we are following this cut off that is a girl who is developing breast budding before the age of 8 years and a, a boy who is developing a testicular enlargement before the age of 9 year we considered as precocious puberty so there were uh, initial concerns whether we should actually lower the age for diagnosing precocious puberty but there has been a study which has shown that if you lower the age too much we may be uh, almost 12% of them might still be having some organic force for uh, gdpp so less than 8 in girls and less than 9 in in boys is what we still use for uh, cut off for the Uh, treatment for uh, diagnosing early puberty 
so increased incidence of early puberty is there now because of you know the main main reasons are in fact insulin resistance and increased obesity in young girls leading to a premature activation of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis and that's why the early puberty does occur now most of the concern is now whether to do an investigation whether not to do an investigation all that problems will start there but as dr kalyan has just said more than the final height now suppose somebody develops a precocious puberty at the age of say seven and a half very unlikely to have an organic cause for precocity but still we go ahead and investigate and treat this child because we are more worried about the psyche the child getting a periods at the age of nine and a half ten years is dis disturbs the child psychologically a lot and obviously sexual abuse is another major concern for these children and therefore we still stick to that eight and nine as uh, the diagnosis age for cutoff thank you I thank you yeah please yeah. go ahead sometimes you know most of the times we don't take that exact criteria of eight and nine but the most of the times it is what is important is the 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 how tall how can we, whether she remains as a short adult or sometimes is also important a second thing is the most of the time it's the parental concerns and uh, there is psychosomatic disturbances because of the body growth all those things to attend all these things we treat sometimes at the age of 9 10 also we do like yeah. to treat yeah absolutely so please go ahead and uh, further once we've confirmed this this is a pr we want to treat mm -hmm. how will you then evaluate and uh, how will you evaluate uh, uh, and investigate yeah. uh, and confirm precocious the probiotic? first thing is you know the simple the the parameters which are important the clinical parameters are important we should we should uh, you know stage the smr staging should be done staging of if it's a girl or a boy that should be done and then the detailed examination height height is very important examination of the height is important then the look for the other secondary signs of any you know associated you know um, the heterosexuality yeah <laughs> so okay they should be seen sometimes acne hair growth and all those things sometimes strain all those things also should be seen and the the fourth thing is go for an x-ray of the left hand that is more important how advanced is the bone age what we see and then we should have a baseline lh lh and the sex steroids either estradiol or testosterone is enough and it, then if it is if you think that it's anything borderline lh is 0.2 to 0.3 then you are still doubtful you can stimulate it with the GnRH analog and then see. Uh, the idea is to differentiate whether you are dealing with a gonadotropin dependent precocious puberty or gonadotropin independent precocious puberty. And then based on that, the further evaluation, if it's dependent, sure. then the evaluation is different. Independent, then the evaluation is for the matching with the other things. Thank you. So, Dr. Ravi, let's say this is a gonadotropin dependent, so it's a just a early puberty. How will you, what are the treatment options available? Just in a nutshell, what is the treatment options available? Only one. <laughs> the question is here whether the precautious puberty is because of central or peripheral is the first question. Second is, as the panelists have clearly said that even if the patient is having at nine, nine and a half or ten years, what is it the patient want? What do the family want? And sometimes reassurance and monitoring will uh, always be helpful because if the mother is too worried for her not to have a period, then I think we need to address that. So the two causes that what we say is what we use is if it's a central cause, we use a GNRH uh, luprolin is what we tend to use to try and block the gonadotrophins and the peripheral actions, whether it's estrogen or testosterone. You could use that either a monthly, three monthly or six monthly. If there are peripheral causes, like causing tumors that needs to be taken off. Again, hypothyroidism is commonly being seen and that needs to be addressed. So the key things is what's causing it, maintaining the height chart, checking for LHFS suppression, and speaking to the parents again and again is the key in the success of precautious puberty. There is a lot of anxiety in the clinic that needs more addressing than the physical. That will come later on. But people understanding precocious puberty from where they're coming from a remote village is, is far, far. They don't, they don't get that. So I think that's where counseling starts first, investigation second, start the treatment and what is their expectation and where we can go with the treatment is what I would say. 
Thank you. More like you please add. Yeah, just sometimes the most important is some isolated events should be differentiated. This is what is most important. Um, that can be done by the, by the bone age and then also for the, by the evaluation of the uterine sizes and ovarian values, they are also important in the evaluation. Yeah. So what Professor was uh, saying is there is isolated thilarchy and isolated, yes. isolated thilarchy, isolated adrenarchy, which means axillary hair, breast bud happening, but without the advancement of bone age is not considered precocious puberty. And we can wait and see. Only if the bone age is advanced, then we can start to evaluate for the uh, precocious puberty. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> So the uh, next uh, topic is about adrenal incidentalomas. We all know that a lot of CTs and MRIs being done for whatever reasons. And as endocrinologists, I, I think you will agree, sir, the, Lord, the, the surgeons do it for a CT of the abdomen for uh, a pre-surgical workup, and they find that there is an incident, adrenal incidentaloma. They stop the surgery, send it to us. And these are being found uh, more, especially before surgery, whether to investigate this or not, uh, and what, if so, what investigations should we do? What, what are the biochemical and what are the radiological investigations to do? So with this in context, let's uh, ask Sir um, uh, Professor Vijay Shekhar Reddy. Yeah. Uh, in routine practice, what is the, your, uh, uh, are you seeing these incident lomas regularly? And if, uh, what, if before surgeries, uh, what is your context? Yeah. When we actually want to look for the adrenals, nobody, nobody. used to report about the CT. <laughs> of the adrenal. <laughs> and when there is a tumor detected, then there will be a referral to you. And usually as per the definitions, more than one centimeter is the definition for the incidentaloma. So when we, there are two things which are important uh, when we see a tumor. One, people are concerned about the malignant potentiality. And second thing is the functional pot potential, whether they are functioning. These are the, because these are the two things where we have to intervene and uh, give the treatment. So as you know, they're very commonly seen. Now the incidental mass prevalence is anywhere from 7 to 12 from various centers at various settings, they do. And among the incidental mass, again, the malignancy is only 2 to 5 percent, you know, 2 to 4 percent or something, very less. So our ultimate aim is to find out whether you're dealing with a, in whether it has, how much is the malignant potential death. Of course, clinically also that is very important. Clinically, if they, sign, if they have a females have a signs of androgenation, then we should also think in that line first of all. And then start investigating for the testosterone, DHEAs in the foreign female. And in a male, you know, we have to see, look into the other things, imaging, both the male and female. So the imaging, imaging modalities will tell you whether you are dealing with a benign or a, um, the malignant condition. The most important is the size. What they say is 4 into 6, 4 to 6, more than that is a matter. But we have reported long back to the me and Sinvas Rao in 2011 in the endocrine conference, European Society of Endocrinology. 13, milli 13 centimeters mass a benign lesion. So that alone criteria may not be a thing. Size is always taken, but size more than, you know, you don't know. You are dealing with a malignancy of 2.5 centimeter also. It's growing. You don't know. You are just seen at that point of time. So what is most important is the monitoring then the borders of the mass, then the homogeneity or heterogeneity, any calcifications are there. Then the most important, uh, the washout, the absolute washout <laughs> and the relative washout. It should be washed out. Then if it's washed out, it's a benign lesion. It's not washed out, then it's the malignant lesions. This is one thing which we go about. And the second thing, as I said, is the functionality, hypercortisolemia, sometimes subclinical hypercortisolemia will be there. Then do the, as usual protocol, what you do for the Cushing's, you should do the, to detect, uh, you know, the hypercortisolemia state, dexamethasone suppression tests and all those things. Then usually aldosteronomas are very small tumors. They're not big tumors. They're usually less than one centimeter tumors. We can easily, in presence of things, we can easily find out, you know, clinically also we can make the difference. Yeah. Usually they're not big tumors. So this is how we go about, uh, you know, and our aim is also to find out functionality and this thing, so that we can take an appropriate map. Sure. Then usually sometimes we get a bilateral things, only certain conditions where we have a bilateral, sometimes metastasis, sometimes rarely fungal, or lymphomas, or usually in a macronodular hyperplasia, CH, and all those things, they'll have a, a bilateral. Sure. Case. Thank you, sir. So Dr. Ravi Kumar, so if, let's say, first of all, do. Do we have to investigate all inc adrenal incidentalomas? If so, how do we start biochemically? First, biochemical, right? Yeah. So I think 
with the, in, with the invention of adrenal adenomas, endocrinologists have become more active. So we've got to look for as to say that, are we looking at something benign? Are we need to be worried or not is the first question. As Professor Vijay Shekhar already said, I like to do it in two ways. If the adenoma, what's the size? Uh, what's the washout? And what is the functioning? So we've talked about the size and washout, and we're talking about whether it's a functioning one. So is this going to cause problems? So there are three or four endocrine causes that needs to be, uh, uh, the general practitioners or anyone need to be aware of. First is Cushing's. So you could do by uh, doing an overnight dexamethasone suppression test. If the patient's got Cushing's and adrenal edema, refer to the endocrinologist. Second, hypertension. So a simple test of hypokalemia and hypertension and adrenal edema, it could ring bells that it could be a primary hyperaldosteronism. So do a renin aldosterone. Third, someone with hypertensive crisis with an adrenal edema, could this be a FIO? You would think of doing serum metanephrines or urine. And four, if you've got a virilized female with adrenal edema, is these functioning tumors? So if you put these four classically, uh, these basic investigations will try and uh, divert you where these patients could land up to. If none of them, then most of them will need annual monitoring of the adenoma if it's non-functioning. How long would you follow up? Is there a uh, data? But usually what we do is up to five years. But after that, what happens? If there's no growth within the five years, it's less likely not to cause any problems. But then mind you that we are subjecting the patient to CD radiation as well. So there's always a chance that you have to pick up as to say, what is it important in this patient? So that's what I would investigate and monitor in my patient with adrenal adenomas. Thank you. So that is the biochemical aspect of it. Dr. Santosh, if we then look at the radiological, I mean, we, a lot of the CTs are done as a plain image and without very much focus on adrenal. So what should we ask the radiologist? How should, uh, how, what would an adrenal protocol CT involve? So to tell you that in 2007, this was a 10 mark question in my DM. <laughs> so uh, now I have to answer that in one minute. So yes, so first thing we look for the size. As uh, has been said before, a size greater than four centimeter is more likely to be malignant. So we have to be more uh, uh, we have to be more proactive in, man in investigating these cases. The second is the Hounsfield units so or the intensity of the signal that's coming. Anything which is of low uh, intensity, 10 hu le or lesser, will be more likely to be a adipose tissue rich to your tumor. So it's like less likely to be benign basically. So if anything is having less than 10 HU, it's likely to be an adenoma, adenoma, myelolipoma, etc. Now the third thing that we look for is a contrast washout. So what does a contrast washout means? After giving contrast, you do a CT scan in the first minute and then you do it again in the 15, after 15 minutes. If there is a contrast washout, that means if the contrast has taken up by the tumor in the first minute but after 15 minutes it's not there it's more likely to be adenoma or benign. If the contrast gets stuck onto the tumor, even after 15 minutes, it's most likely to be malignant, especially pheochromocytoma seems to be the major part and other uh, malignancies, adrenal adenomas, et cetera. Good, well done, <laughs> one minute. <laughs> thank you, so in the interest of time, we'll not take the fifth question and thank you all the panelists for answering these questions.